hopefully that's the last of them. So, my name is Malcolm Young. Um, I'm on Drupal and all that, as Twitter, all the rest of it, as Malcolm Young. I work at Capgemini, and I want to talk to you about the code review. So, why it's a good thing to do, how to do it, a few bits and pieces around it. And hopefully, it will help you to improve your teams. Because I know, in the last few years, in my experience, code review has been a massive help in improving not just the quality of the code that we're delivering, but the skills of the team that are delivering that, that code. Um, so I think one of the important things with code review is all about asking questions. And um, I don't claim to know all the answers, and I'm not going to attempt to give all the answers in this talk. But hopefully I'll help you to ask some of the right questions. Um, and yeah. If you do have questions, feel free to, to stop me as you go along. Uh, caffeinate should stop my screen from doing that, shouldn't it? One minute. So, yeah, sorry. So we've had some, some technical bother, which means I'm running on, on two laptops, so please forgive me if I'm looking like some terrible DJ. Um, so, yeah, as I was saying, it's all about asking questions, this code review business. So if you do have questions as we go along, please feel free to shout out. And the first question that I want to ask about code review, pretty basic one, what is it? So once upon a time there was this thing called a Fagan inspection, which sounds like something out of Oliver Twist, but um, it was a meeting where the team would sit together and they'd go through code line by line by line, um, either printed out or on screen, which sounds pretty horrible. And I think every blog post that I've ever read on the subject of code review uses this cartoon. This cartoon. <laughs> um, so... <coughs> We all have to, to go with the tradition on that one. <laughs> that the difference between good code and bad code is all about how confusing it is in a lot of times. Um, but this idea of a team of people sitting together, staring at code together, it's not great. It's, I'm thankful I've never done it, but I imagine it's pretty time-consuming pretty tedious, pretty inefficient. So is there a better way of doing it? Uh, yes, there is. So these days, I guess, most of you are hopefully familiar with using Git, different branching models. Um, so when you're working on something, the standard process, if you're in Git, would be create a branch, commit your changes, and then create a pull request into the main branch. And that pull request allows people to see what those changes are and review them. So you get something like this. And <coughs> with a quick search of, of Flickr, the first image of a pull request that came up was on Joomla. So it feel, feels kind of appropriate for a Drupal talk. But, um, so what you'll see with a pull request, if you're not familiar with this, a red line showing you here's a line that's been removed, here's a, a green line with what's new. Um, and so you get members of the team, senior, junior, everyone, let's have a look. Are we happy with this change? If so, merge it in. Um, in case you're not familiar with um, Git branching workflows, there's a very good uh, article tutorial by Atlassian. Um, so yeah, if you're not familiar with it, I'd very much recommend that. 
Um, and so that's the basics. But before I go further, I want to say thank you to Mr. Alex Fox. Um, so we've got a lot of reasons in the Drupal community to be thankful to him. Um, so I was lucky enough, a few years ago, he worked with us at Capgemini. I can see a few familiar faces in the, in the room, and I guess they would also share this view, hopefully. Um, he was a very big influence on, on our team, and I think on the community as a whole, um, and in particular, in this area of code review. He was one of the guys that really pushed for that to be a, a massive part of our workflow, um, and set a very high standard, making sure... See some, some nodding down the front here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> high standards, pedantic, picky, call it what you like. But there's a lot to be said for having those high standards. Um, and obviously, he's no longer with us at Capgemini. He's become one of the core maintainers of the, of the Drupal project as a whole. Um, and I think he probably does even more code review now of patches than he used to back then. Um, but yeah, I want to say thanks because. <coughs> I certainly learned a lot from him, and um, I think I wouldn't be doing this talk if it wasn't for what he'd helped me learn. So, why are we doing this? So, you might get some pushback from project managers, you might get clients thinking, oh, you know, we need to get these features out the door on time, we need, we need to rush things through, um, people breathing down your neck, that perception of, is it just a waste of time? For, for developers to sit around talking about code. Um, and I would hope that, well, I would, I would very strongly push back on that um, because <coughs> everybody makes mistakes. Um, <coughs> even Alex, even, doesn't matter how, <laughs> doesn't matter how senior you are, how much experience you've got, you're still going to make mistakes. Sooner or later, you'll, you know, press a key before hitting the commit button. Um, you'll, you'll find some problem. So it's much better to get those mistakes spotted. So obviously, you know, most teams will be doing some kind of QA, some kind of testing. Um, but one of, the, one of the keys, I think, especially when you're in larger teams, is to get really fast feedback loops. So ideally, the fastest feedback loop of all is before you commit anything, you look at the diff of what you're committing. If there is a mistake, hopefully you spot it there. Um, if, if you do commit and push it up, once you see it in that slightly different context, the, the, uh, the red lines and the green lines on the screen that we saw earlier from the pull request, seeing that different context is hopefully going to see that code in, in, in a new light. Um, you hopefully will spot potential problems then. And um, to come back to that point that project managers might suggest to you that code review is a waste of time, um, it's, it's a false economy. So not reviewing code is going to cause you more problems in the longer term. Um, and anyone that says it's not good value, I would suggest showing them this graph. Um, so this is from a few years ago on a very large project. At the time we were using SVN, um, and this is from my colleague Tom Fevian's blog from I don't know how many years ago. But the two graphs we've got here, this top one is the percentage of our custom code that had been reviewed. And this bottom one is along the same time axis, the number of new defects that were getting raised. So it's pretty clear to me, as you increase the amount of code review that's going on, you decrease the number of new bugs that, that are getting created. And if you care about quality, and you should, um, you should be doing code review. And in my opinion, it's, <coughs> it's almost as important as testing. Um, so spotting and fixing those problems as early as possible and improving the efficiency of your team. You know, if you can spot that problem before you've wasted the time of, let's do a build into the test environment, let's get either our automated tests or, or manual tests <coughs> to look at that, you're going to be much more efficient as a team. Um, and hopefully that will end up with happy clients, happy project managers. Um, so yeah, number one reason, I would say, 
prevent bugs. Second reason for doing code review is to improve the maintainability of your code. To stop yourself ending up with this big, horrible, tangled mess. You know, I guess you may have all seen these projects where it goes on for a little while, someone adds their little bit of code, someone else adds their little bit of code, and before you know, you've ended up with this enormous function um, that's really a nightmare to maintain. So as you're putting those changes in, code reviews this opportunity to say, well, could we be doing this a better way? Could we be refactoring this into separate functions to make it more maintainable? Um, and most projects go on for a fair while. And the cost of maintenance is going to outweigh the cost of build. So you're going to come back to that code that you wrote before, or your future colleagues will come back to that code. And if you've taken the time to review it, to make it more maintainable, your future self will thank your present self, and so will your colleagues. Um, so yeah, reason number two, code maintainability. And the third reason why I think code review is important is learning. And somehow my notes have gone crazy. Bear with me a sec. So, learning. I've mentioned it a little bit at the start. Um, so, personally, I think I've learned an enormous amount from code reviews. And that's not just people looking at the code I've written and saying, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, which they have done and they still do. Um, but it's also about what I've learned from other people's code you get the chance to see different ways of approaching problems that you might not have thought of. Um, and this, excuse me, this ties into this idea that I mentioned before, that it's not just about you write your code, you create the pull request, the senior most developer on the team looks at it, passes judgment from on high, everyone on the team has something to contribute. It doesn't matter if you're, if you're junior, if you're new, um, it's not just about the senior people telling the junior people how it should be done. Everyone might be able to think of better ways of doing things. Everyone might have something to contribute. Um, so yeah, great learning resource. So hopefully you're with me on this idea that it's a good thing to do it. Um, so how do we do it? Um, most common things that we might use, GitHub, Bitbucket, obviously there's, there's things like GitLab as well, more. Um, so these, these are the big ones of hosted Git repositories that have built-in um, reviewing tools in the pull request mechanisms. Um, so I've mentioned the branching model before, and like I say, if you're not sure about that, have a look at that Atlassian talk I mentioned earlier. Um, but basically before code gets merged into your main branch, you're going to get it approved. So I guess most people have probably seen something like this before. Here's the pull request. You review it. You look at it and say, yep, I'm happy for this to go into, into production. And that is an important step because it's not just about here is one individual who wrote this code. As a team, we're all responsible for the quality of the product that we put out. And when, when a person says, right, I approve this code, you're putting your name to that as well. You're sharing that responsibility. And you can't later just look at Git blame and say, okay, this guy wrote this line of code. It's this person's fault. We're all, we all take that responsibility as a team for maintaining quality. <coughs> So, as, as we're doing code reviews, what is it that we want to be looking for? Um, so, some of this stuff is going to be specific to Drupal, some of it not so much. Um, but I think the main things that we want to look for, first one, will it work? So, is this change that we're making 
actually doing what the client wants it to do? Are there any edge cases that we might not have thought of? Um, are there any potential bugs in it? And part of that, you know, obviously, this is going to be specific to your project and your requirements, so there aren't going to be general rules to that. But know what you're trying to achieve, check that the code is actually going to achieve it. And oftentimes, the best way to do that is to check out that branch in your local environment and just test it for yourself. You know, see, if there's, see if there's anything that doesn't work quite as expected. Are there any edge cases that you might not have thought of? Um, I know Lullabot have built this tool called Tugboat that lets you, every time a pull request gets created, it can spin up a whole test environment so that you can get the QA team or the client or yourself to, to look at it. Um, that's a fairly high-tech solution to this. The lower-tech solution is, as a developer, check out the code yourself, see what happens. Um, few other main points to be looking for. So security. Yeah. Are you making the site vulnerable to any attacks, cross-site scripting, SQL injection? Um, performance. Are you make, potentially making the site slower? Because um, that's going to cause problems for your clients and for your users. Accessibility. So are you potentially causing problems for some of the users of that site? And I touched on it already, maintainability. Are you causing problems for your team in the future? So those are, those are the main areas. And I want to go through each of them in turn very briefly. Um, like I say, will it work? That depends on your project, so I can't really help on that point. Um, but security. And I definitely do not claim to be an expert on this, um, but there are some, some general rules of thumb, things that when I'm doing a code review, I would always try and watch out for. Um, and first rule, I would say, is trust no one. Um, definitely don't trust someone that gets a tattoo like that <laughs> <laughs> and wears their phone on their belt as well. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. In the context of websites, <laughs> never trust user input. Um, anytime you're seeing input from the user being handled, as you're in the, the code view, in that pull request, think about, okay, how's this user input getting used? Is there any possibility that an attacker can inject JavaScript into the page? Or they could potentially um, write SQL injection attacks. Because if, if they can, if you're just taking, here is some raw user input from a query string, from wherever, an attacker could potentially take over your site, cause you all kinds of problems. Um, so, yeah, sanitize everything. Now, that would be a whole separate talk to go into, and I don't have the time to cover that, but there is a lot, <coughs> and also I'm not enough of an expert on it. Um, Drupal docs about writing secure code, the various different sanitization functions that there are. Um, slightly different docs for seven and eight, obviously. Um, so on top of user input, the other thing I would think about in... Um, security terms on a code review is, you know, are we changing the types of data that we're getting from users? Is that sensitive data? Is it personal information? If so, how are we storing it? Where, how are we transmitting it? Do we need to encrypt it? Basically, any time you're changing the data structures that you're using, think about that data that's coming from, from users and what you need to do with it to make sure you keep it safe. Next point I wanted to talk about, performance. Um, keeping things fast. So, again, enormous subject. <coughs> I'm not an expert. Um, I think, from a code review point of view, one of the top things I would want to look out for is, are we creating any unnecessary sessions? Um, 
Because in, in Drupal, especially if you're using reverse proxy caches, as soon as you're creating sessions, you're making things less cacheable. You're making the server do more work. So if you're seeing code from a colleague that's saying, all right, get this data, store it in a session for an anonymous user, is there a better way of doing that that means you don't need to create a session? So yeah, keep things cacheable as much as possible. Um, are you writing any inefficient loops? This, this whole two-screen setup is confusing me a lot. Um, so like I say, performance, massive subject, but definitely want to keep an eye out for, key enough, keep an eye out on when you're doing code reviews. Next subject. Um, so I don't know if you guys can see what's going on here. This is down by the, the shout tank. So here we have some steps. And here... So, accessibility. Um, again, another massive subject, far too big to go into here. Um, but in code reviews, especially on the front end, there's a few sort of checklist <coughs> ground rules that you can bear in mind. So, number one, think about how keyboard users or users of other assistive devices are going to be using your website. Um, again, you can check out the branch in your local environment. You can test it out. Um, if you're writing CSS, you can always think about any time you're applying a hover state, what about focus state? Also, are you hiding text appropriately? So if there's text that will show later, think about how is that going to be handled by a screen reader? general rule, if you're looking at display none, you're going to be keeping it out of screen reader users. So look at accessible <coughs> hiding techniques. Hover and focus I mentioned. Um, pretty useful checklist from the accessibility project to, to have a look at if you're not familiar with it. Um, again, it's something that you could really dive deep into. Um, and then the next one, so maintainability. So looking at how your team is going to work with this code in future. Um, so you want to make your life easy. You don't want to cause yourself too many problems. So as you're seeing new code come into the system, think about, are you writing more code than you need to? Is someone doing some crazy custom thing that they don't even need to do? Are they using APIs appropriately? No. Don't, don't be afraid to look at the Drupal docs, see what's, um, excuse me, uh, see what, what functions already exist. Um, as well as that, unit test coverage. So, how much of your, your custom code can be unit tested? If it can't, should it be? There's a possibility you could look at make, making it, breaking things down into smaller functions so you can test it. Um, and comments. You know, if your code is hard to understand, that's a sign there might be something wrong. So are there enough comments? Are there too many comments? Sometimes, if you've got too many comments, it just becomes noise. Again. Um, and on the subject of code maintainability, there's something in particular. Um, Larry Garfield talked about it at uh, DrupalCon London a few, a few years ago. And that's code smells. Um, so what is a code smell? Um, so it's a sign of possible problems. Um, so Larry did a, a great talk, I think it was, what's that, six years ago? Um, and that was, I think, the first Drupal event I'd been to. Really good talk. I would very much recommend checking that out. But as you're doing code reviews, think about some of these code smells. So they're not, they're not rules, they're kind of guidelines of here's something that might be causing problems. Um, so, in his talk, Larry mentioned seven common code smells. <coughs> the first one was and. 
So if, if the description of your function is, does this and do that, it's doing too much. Break it down into two separate functions. Or does your function sometimes do this, sometimes do that? Again, bad sign. Um, so as you're reviewing code, keep an eye out for these sorts of things. If. So do you have a lot of conditions in the same function? Are you ending up with excessive complexity? Okay. Testability, we touched on them a minute ago. Um, can, it, can your code be tested? If it can't, should it be, be testable? Documentation. So, again, are there enough comments? Are there too many comments? Um, tight coupling. So, is this part of your system, does it stand alone? Could you take it out into a class and use it somewhere else? Or is it too dependent on other parts of your system? Um, and the last of Larry's seven smells, um, impurity. So does your, your function have some side effects plus return values? So all of these would be things to look out for in custom code that you're writing. Um, obviously with Drupal, we're in a lucky position that there's a lot of contributed code out there. So we need to think about there's a module for that, people say, but is it appropriate to use that module? Um, so when you're adding custom modules, when you're adding contributed modules to your code base, don't think that just because it's published on the internet means it's perfect. You know, there are bugs in contributed modules. So as you're adding them, review them. You know, if you spot problems, obviously issues on Drupal.org. <coughs> Um, but also, as you're adding those contributed modules, ask yourself if that's the right choice. Similarly, as you're adding custom modules, ask yourself, is that the right choice? So, contributed modules, often they're, they're a bit like Swiss Army knives. They, they serve a lot of different purposes, but they might not be optimised for your specific purpose. So, that, that ties in with the performance questions we talked about earlier. Um, you might think, you know, modules like rules, they're massively flexible, but they can also give you performance headaches. They can maybe make life more confusing for your, your site editors than it needs to be. Um, so sometimes you just want something very specific to your, your purpose. So, yeah, if you're creating a custom module, think about should we use a contrib module instead? Or perhaps should we use, should we take our custom module and turn it into a contributed module? Equally, when you've got a contrib module, is it the right choice? Um, but yeah, anytime you're writing a custom module, think about could you make it more generic? Um, is it something that you could contribute back to the community? And that's something that, that we do try and do at, at Capgemini. We've got a few examples of <coughs> things we've built for clients that we've thought. Okay, well, yeah, let's make this generic. Let's put it back into the community because other people will, will use it. Um, this slide, I just like the, the picture, really. Um, so I think one of the big challenges on any project is communication. Um, doing enough communication, doing clear communication. And code view is another opportunity for communication. So, yeah, speak your mind. I don't know about the first talk. Um, so be open and frank and honest with your colleagues. You know, if you see a problem, speak up. Just because you're junior or new to the team or unconfident doesn't mean you can't ask questions or spot problems. Um, and if you don't understand what a piece of code is doing, it may well say more about the code than it does about your abilities. So if it's hard to understand for you now, it's going to be hard to understand for the team maintaining <coughs> that in the future. Um, so yeah, everyone on the team has something to say. And you shouldn't, shouldn't be afraid to say it. On the other hand, um, 
don't make it personal. So you're reviewing the code. You're not reviewing the person that wrote the code. Um, back in the start, I talked about everyone makes mistakes. And that's how we learn. So writing bad code does not make you a bad person. And being a good person doesn't mean you always write good code. Um, so code review isn't a competition. It's not a chance to score points off the other people on your team. Um, and you are a team, so support each other. You know, help your colleagues to improve. Um, if you see something, someone doing something that you think isn't the right way of doing it, don't just say, this is wrong. Explain why you think it's wrong. If you've read an article that helps you to, to see why that might not be the best way of doing things, share a link to that article. You know, share ideas. And um, I've, I've talked a lot about mistakes and bad code, but code review isn't just about that. It's also an opportunity. You know, if you see, here's someone who's written, written something to, to solve a problem, and it's a really nice way of solving that problem, point to that example. Share that with your team. Say, yeah, I really like this way of doing it. You know, it's, it's very easy to forget that we're all humans and we need a bit of support from, from time to time. So yeah, get the whole team involved. Be supportive. Don't just, don't just criticize where you see negative things. Be positive where you can. Um, and another slide did that. Like I say, we're all humans, um, but machines can be better than humans at some things. Not that many, but um, so where machines are better, use them. Um, so for instance, coding standards. Um, really important. I'm a bit of a pedant on this subject about um, sticking to Drupal coding standards in Drupal projects in other projects, stick to whatever standards are on that <coughs> project. The important thing is having that standard so everyone's writing code to the same style. Um, and if you're in a pull request, writing comments saying, oh, put a full stop at the end of this comment, have the right amount of white space, that gets pretty tedious. So get the machines to do that for you. Um, and the appropriate level of automation is going to vary depending on your team. So at CADGAM and I, we're a pretty big team. We've gone to a level where, so for instance, when someone creates a pull request, Jenkins is going to run PHP code sniffer against that. So if you're introducing new coding standards violations, that pull request isn't going to get merged. Um, it's going to run the unit test. If the unit test fails, the pull request isn't going to get merged. Um, we run PHP mess detector, so if you're introducing enormous levels of complexity, the code isn't going to get merged. Um, smaller teams, if you're working on your own, that might feel like overkill, but you can always set up your development environment. Um, some docs on Drupal.org about how to get PHP sniffer integrated with whatever it is that you use, you know, so that as you're writing the code, it's picking up any um, places where you're not matching coding standards. You can also set up pre-commit hooks so that before you even push your changes to the repo, um, a machine is going to check, are you, are you breaking any coding standards, etc. Um, <coughs> and like I say, there's also uh, Jenkins continuous integration, so there's quite a nice template that people have put together. Um, we're using that on a couple of projects to, to get Jenkins to check the status of the code before you can merge that in. Um, so a lot of these points that I've mentioned, it's about spotting bad code and it can be a bit like needle in a haystack. So when you are looking for a needle in a haystack, try and keep that haystack small. Um, in the same way, talking about code smells, long functions are a code smell. They're a sign that something might be wrong. Similarly, 
big pull requests are a sign that there might be something wrong. Um, with Git, branching is easy. If you've got a big feature, have a feature branch for that. Have pull requests going into that branch. Um, review them as they go along, because it's a lot easier to review small changes than large changes. Um, there's a tweet that I quite like from a while ago. If you see 10 lines of code, the people on your team are going to spot 10 problems with that. If you're going to if you have an enormous pull request, people will read the first file, they'll read the first couple of files, but after a while they'll suffer from attention fatigue. It's pretty difficult to review these large changes. And if you give people too much information, they're going to struggle. There's this cognitive load that people will suffer from if, if they're trying to review large changes. And also, if you've got a large change, it's much more likely that you will spot problems and then it will go around for another loop, and then you'll spot other problems, and then you'll lose track of where you are. So, yeah, it's difficult, it's difficult to spot problems in large changes. Um, and doing code review properly is something that requires concentration, and um, it's pretty difficult to concentrate for a long time. And that kind of feels like an appropriate <coughs> place to finish. Um, so thanks very much. Uh, here's some places where I got some images from. Here are a couple of blog posts that I wrote on the subject. Um, and here's, okay, so on Twitter. here are the slides for this talk. And that is our uh, engineering team blog. Um, also, we've got a stall out in the, um, in the foyer there, so please, if you do have any questions, if you want to have a chat later, come and say hello, come and talk to us. There's, there's quite a few of us. Um, we have some lovely T-shirts to give away, so, so yeah, come and say hello, and uh, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, if anyone does have any questions, fire away. Uh, either that or come. Come and say hello. Uh, yeah, um, so you mentioned that uh, coding is not just for your senior engineers and stuff. Um, what's the process going about like, deciding who does the coding? Like, should it be everyone? Should it be a select few? Yeah. It, there's that um, line, I think it's from Kent Beck, where any answer to an interesting question starts with it depends. Um, so, yeah, it depends on the project and it depends on the area of the project. So, um, certainly with Zipbucket and with GitHub, you can, as you're creating a pull request, you can assign reviewers. So you might think, okay, well, here's, here's, an air, here's a CSS change, so let's assign the, the front-end guys to look at that. Or you might think, here's a, an area of the code that I know such and such a person has worked on. Um, what you might also want to think about is the fact that not all reviews are equal. So I know certainly with GitHub and Bitbucket, you can set it up so that before it gets merged, the pull request has to have a, a certain number of approvals. Um, with GitHub, certainly it can be, unless those approvals are from people with, merge ac with right access to the main repo, you know, if you're working on forks, they'd need right access to the main repo. So effectively, there's your senior people who, when they approve it, it's a big green tick. When people without that right access approve it, it's a grey tick. So yeah, you do need to, to make sure that the right people are reviewing <coughs> it. And you also probably want to make not have an enormous number of reviewers um, it, it depends on the structure of your team and on the on the structure of your project, I would say. Um, but yeah, I would always want, ideally, a couple of people to, to look over code because you know, if you come from that thought of, well, everyone makes mistakes, you might not spot a problem. So one reviewer may not spot it. So it's definitely worth getting multiple eyes on that.
much a question, but just a comment. One thing I've heard is like as soon as you start a branch or an issue, you can open a pull request on it, ask for pull first commit, then anyone assigned with reviews will get notified that they need to open a push, and then you don't need to take in like 500 lines or 500 files at once. You can see something growing, and then along the way, say, oh, don't go any further with this. I think we need to rethink how we're doing it because if you wait a week or two or three, it wouldn't be too late. Yeah, I mean, that, that kind of ties in with that idea of having the feature branches um, and having small pull requests into that. Yeah. Um, we've tried it on a couple of, of occasions doing that, create the pull request first, even when it's, you know that it's not ready to merge. Um, personally, I'm not a big fan of that. Um, I think I would prefer to have some conversations about the general approach um, because you've got this pull request yeah are you going to actually approve it you know even if you're even if you're reviewing it as you go along it's going to grow and grow and grow at the point where it's really big you might not remember how much of it you've already reviewed so effectively you would need to spend the same amount of time reviewing the whole thing i would say Yeah. Just coming along. And yeah. You can know, oh, I got an email about this. I'm busy right now, but come along tomorrow. We'll have a quick look how, see if I'm, see if I agree with this way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is. I've heard, definitely heard that proposed. Like I say personally, I would prefer. Here's this thing that we know is going to be big. Let's have a lot of pull requests into that, and then when we think it's ready, a big pull request from that branch into the main branch. Because um, that way you get that extra level of confidence of, right, well, we know that these changes have all been reviewed. So that final pull request can be a bit more of a, just a quick skim down it. <coughs> Has it changed the way we estimate? Um, <coughs> so I think most developers are guilty of underestimating stuff. Um, <coughs> you know, it's, it's very easy to think, okay, well, I can write the code for that. That'll be half a day's work. And you don't think about, okay, well, we also need to test it. We also need to write documentation for it. We also need to deploy it to this environment, that environment. We also need to... Um, production and so on. So, yeah, definitely code review is something you need to factor into that. Um, I think bigger picture, it's, I definitely believe it doesn't increase the overall um, amount of time that it takes to build something because you're getting that extra confidence that once it's in the test environment, it's more likely to pass first time. Um, but yeah, it is definitely something you need to, to take into account. So are you still dealing with this frequent like having the uh, or maybe the frequent version and or the mobile configuration to do like I scale the thing with the pull request might be quite big, right? So we have I might say the content type and add the two and then do the frequent model and dump the configuration into the code and pull it together and pull it together. In that case like how do you manage the cost? Yeah, I mean so features or yeah, through play with the new configuration manager. Those pull requests are going to be pretty large. Um, there's not really any way of avoiding that. Um, yeah, I'd like to think still just review it. You're going to you're going to see in those pull requests a lot of green lines, um, but you still do need to, to look at them to make sure nothing crazy is going in there. Yeah, so, so the question was about, on this team they do, is that like with the tugboat, tugboat type that they're set up? Yeah, so it changes things up like small uh, tugs on the tugboat. Mm -hmm. so, so that is another way of doing it. We do it 
in series rather than in parallel. Um, my personal view on that is if, if you create the code with the pull request and then get the other developers to review it, it's, it's possible that everything might change. And if everything does change, then the test team would be wasting their time testing this code that hasn't been reviewed. Um, so yeah, we, we, we tend to work with um, a, so one initial test environment and then a more stable release prep test environment. Um, and we would only get it into the initial test environment after it's passed that code review status. Um, Yeah, I think that main point for me was the not having the possibility that the testers are, are going to waste their time on that. Yeah, so in our in our scenario, client on client sign-off would be after our own internal QA. So it would be dev, devs testing for themselves <coughs> locally, code review, potentially devs testing other people's code locally, then merge that code into, into the main development branch, get that into the test environment, get our own QA team on that, and we would only ask the clients to look at it after it's passed our QA, and, and then, yeah, the, um, after that, client sign off and then production deployment. Yeah, I mean, certainly the projects that I've been involved in, a lot of times the clients don't want to spend that much time directly involved. They just want to see the, the fruits of the labour. Um, so, yeah, again, kind of with the early point about <coughs> not wanting to waste our QA team's time, it's that not wanting to waste, even more so, wanting to waste, not wanting to waste the client's time because they would be even more annoyed. Yeah, I haven't really. Um, what I would say on that front is if you ever find yourself in, if you're still in features, I suppose the same would be true in, in Drupal 8 actually, of where the code and the, the site have got out of, out of sync, I, I would always want to do, right, here's one commit and one pull request to get the feature back in sync with what's in the database and then a new commit and a new pull request to be, right, well, here's what we're actually changing to try and minimise it. But in terms of trying to reduce the, the mental load of, of those large pull requests, nothing I'm aware of. So if anyone has got those ideas, I'd like to hear them. Yeah, that, that's that's true. And yeah, certainly, certainly GitHub. There's a query string. I forget what it is that lets you ignore white space diffs. Um, I imagine there probably is one on Bitbucket as well. I don't know. Yeah, I, I would normally recommend doing the individual pull request into that into that shared feature branch. Um, so would that be done with private forks or separate branches from? Again, so we've we've got some projects that use private forks, um, others that have separate branches. Um, it, 
doesn't make an enormous amount of difference, I don't think, in terms of the way you handle that. Um, yeah, if you're all on branches, you do have that option of everybody pushing into the same branch. You know, you might have the CSS changes and, and the PHP changes, and you might want to put them in the same branch. But I would, I would still prefer, in order to keep the pull requests small and easier to review, I would prefer to have them as separate pull requests, then going into a feature branch, if you think that that feature might not be ready for the next deployment from your main development branch. Thank you very much for listening, and uh, yeah, come and say hello.